were three couples. They decided to downsize, so they're now living mortgage-free in a beautiful triplex, and they are going on vacations. They're having the time of their life. The problem is you can't really put a sign on the front of the house that says for sale, half interest, third interest, because nobody's going to buy in. And especially when you know your partner is in there because they couldn't afford a whole house and now they're being asked to buy you out. In order to survive, I couldn't continue living in my house if I hadn't um, rented out or taken in students. But it turned out to be a very positive thing. It's been great so far. I really wanted to own a home and couldn't afford to do it on my own, so found two of my really good friends that were willing to do it with me. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Libby Snymer. Welcome to The Zoomer, I'm Libby Snymer. Home sharing is not exactly a new concept. There was a time when taking in borders was commonplace. And some of the most popular sitcoms like The Golden Girls have been based on various home sharing scenarios. Today, similar arrangements are popping up in real life as home ownership becomes less and less attainable and more Zoomers look to make their money last. It's a solution that also provides companionship and community. But there are also pitfalls. Before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. Around the globe, the concept of home sharing is gaining momentum particularly among Zoomers who find themselves alone after death or divorce. Cooperative living with friends or family can cut costs and add companionship. Small towns and cities across North America are developing their own platforms. Nesterly is currently operating in Boston, which pairs Zoomers with graduate students willing to help out around the house. In Toronto, the city launched a pilot called the Toronto Home Share Pilot Project, which similarly matches older adults with cash-strapped students. And although the pilot will start out small, there's plenty of inventory. In Toronto alone, some two million bedrooms sit empty. A similar picture exists across the country. In Ottawa, nearly 80% of owners live in homes with extra bedrooms. And in Vancouver, an estimated 800,000 bedrooms are vacant. Of course, this isn't the only form of home sharing. There's also co-ownership where unrelated people get together and buy a house. But it seems kind of like a movement. So Laura, how did it all come about? We're seeing people who are really struggling with housing needs. People want to own homes and people want to be connected with community. And as we're growing older in our population, we're seeing some of those ties come apart. So how are we able to meet both of those needs? And what we're seeing really often is across generations, but sometimes even within generations, people coming together and saying, how can we make sure we have someone to have dinner with? How can we make sure that we have someone to take care of the dog or do garden duties? But how can we also make sure that we have enough money to keep our housing and live where we want? But where did it all start? Home, uh, home sharing has been uh, in existence for decades. Uh, we looked at some research uh, at the National Initiative for the Care of the Elderly and um, what we've seen is as early as 1989 and probably even before that. Uh, it, we'd be, we're seeing a rise in it now, I believe, because of the low vacancy rates in many of our urban centres. Uh, in the City of Toronto alone, we have a less than 1% vacancy rate. So we're looking at ways to mitigate a housing crisis as well as allow older adults to age successfully in their homes. Tara, you have a business that matches people for this. So uh, when did you start your business and, and uh, have you seen an uptick in recent years? I just recently started the business uh, about two years ago and it was um, the idea uh, spawned from my own personal experience and for home sharing and I'm seeing a growing trend, a lot of curiosity in the beginning, um, going out to presentations and speaking in the community where individuals that are homeowners never really considered this before until they you know learn about more and more in the newspapers or you know writing articles about it. So it's more of a cultural shift we're trying to create and changing attitudes for Canadians to address that issue and become more innovative with solutions that you know they might feel stuck in situations. 
Leslie, same question to you. I mean, it, it's become a business for you, yeah, so there absolutely. had to be a, a uh, I won't say a groundswell, but but when did you well, start Well, I mean, to it came it? to me before I joined the industry of real estate, which was I'm a, I have a background in social policy, and every dinner party, every event I ever went to, somehow real estate came up, and the stresses that it was causing for young families as well as an older population, mostly from an economic affordability perspective. but. In those conversations also came the other stresses. And so I thought, well, what's the best and most effective way to help people get into housing, which is to become a real estate agent and specialize in cooperative purchasing. So helping people buy together to reduce some of those stresses, loneliness, the affordability, making it more accessible on other levels as well. Right, but so how long have you been doing that as a business? About a year and a half now, oh, okay. full time. And is is the, um, what I'm asking is the is trend that, is growing rapidly. Right. I wish I had enough houses for the clients I have. Uh, and Elizabeth, you've been doing this on an informal basis for a very long time. Well, with me, it started when my husband died in 1996, and I have a large house. My two children were married and had moved out. I had four empty bedrooms. So, and I also hated to be alone in a house. The radiators make noise, the wooden floors creak, and you're always wondering what those <laughs> noises are. And someone told me about um, a language students who need to live with a family or in a house, uh, and that helped. The other reason I started is Mike Harris' uh, government, I was a school trustee, and he had cut our salaries by uh, down to 25% of what they were. So in order to survive, I couldn't continue as a trustee living in my house if I hadn't um, rented out or taken in students. But it turned out to be a very positive thing, uh, an experience having young people from different countries who asked questions about English, questions I'd never thought of, and uh, I would cook for them. Sometimes they'd cook for me. It was a wonderful two-way ex exchange. And Kelly, uh, you have entered into a co-ownership agreement. Is it just just a matter of weeks? Tell us yes, about it. Yes, it's been under a month, and uh, it's been great so far. I really wanted to own a home and couldn't afford to do it on my own, so found two of my really good friends that were willing to do it with me, so here we are. <laughs> and how's it going? So far, so great. <laughs> And uh, do you each have your own shelf in the fridge, or do you share your food? Or a little what? bit of both. So some, like, main meals we'll cook together, but then we'll also, you know, have your own things that you want to eat as well. At, at what kind of a rate is this growing, would you say? At this point in time, 100% of my clients are looking at co-purchasing and having different structures. So as Kelly was saying, you know, they've got one fridge, they share meals. There are some people who want to buy a triplex, for example, and, and live in their own units. Uh, but share maybe the backyard. So it's there's different degrees of sharing, mm -hmm. so to speak. So, uh, but uh, every phone call I get now is clients interested in exploring this possibility. Okay, and Tara, you're matching people as a business, but uh, they're, you're cooperating, CARP is cooperating with the City of Toronto on a non-profit uh, basis mm -hmm. uh, to do the same thing, to put people mm -hmm. together. Uh, tell me about that. Well, we offer a comprehensive matching process. We want to really emphasize the safety of the older adult that's opening up their home, as well as the student that is maybe entering into a new situation. So I'm a registered social worker, and I, uh, along with another social worker, complete the matching process. So we're looking at forms that identify the type of space that the older adult has, the type of space the student is looking for, whether or not there's a private bath or a shared bath, uh, kitchen arrangements, and then we work together to create an interview where the student and the older adult meet each other and hopefully we have a good match. Um, the student and the older adult have complete autonomy in making the decision of whether or not they feel this is a good match and then we provide support throughout that entire process. We provide mediation supports if there's a little bit of conflict that they're not able to kind of work through on their own. Um, we've done a couple of those during this project and they've worked out really really well and it's it's just about adjusting to a new relationship and to a new person in your space. And uh, how many people have you matched so far? We successfully matched uh, 12 matches, so 24, 24 people are working with us in the program. And Laura, do you find, are, 
does this give Zoomers an extra comfort about taking someone into their house? What's the initial feeling of most people that you deal with? Very much what we're hearing is a lot of interest. We get calls on a regular basis saying, you know, we have a need, we've heard about this, we want to know more. I think from a car point of view, what we really want to do is work in a system that has supports around it. What we loved about this pilot project is that aspect of social working and interviewing and matching and ongoing um, interaction with the program. I think we've seen that as a, a really successful opportunity. And we're looking at it, bringing that across the country now. So we have a lot more to discuss here. We'll come back and take a closer look at home sharing programs that pair seniors and students. Stay tuned. I have a checklist of all the issues. What about food? What about expenses? It's really a divorce agreement that you enter into when everybody's getting along well. A 2017 study by the Canadian Centre for Economic Analysis, there are 5 million spare bedrooms here in the province of Ontario. The City of Toronto is trying to fill at least some of them through the pilot project that we were just talking about that matches seniors who have more house than they need with students who can't afford to live on their own. So, Tanya, do you have a target for how many people you would like to match through this program? Well, it was a small pilot project that was funded through uh, the Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility with the province of Ontario. So our target was actually 10 matches. So we were able to exceed that target by four participants. We would love nothing more than to see this project grow uh, within the city of Toronto and to grow nationwide. Five million spare bedrooms equals approximately 25 years worth of construction. So when you think about new development, new building for affordable and accessible housing, those five million spare bedrooms can go a long way to addressing housing issues for not only students, but older adults. We see many programs across the country that are dealing with peer-to-peer -peer, uh, home sharing as well. That's matching older adults with older adults. Uh, and it is successful and a facilitated model um, seems to be one that works very well uh, internationally as well. Okay, Elizabeth, you've been doing this on your own, informally. What advice do you have or what did you find worked for you the best? Or, and, and did you have any really bad pairings? No, I, I didn't have any bad pairings. But I think part of it was that I have a large house. There's extra bathrooms. So, so there's a lot of other people. You know, yeah. uh, I know, yeah. but that helps. You're not having fights over, you know, timing there. But I think it's, I'm easygoing. I don't have a lot of rules. The only rule I have is no smoking and no loud music. Okay, a couple of questions. Number one, cannabis is now legal. Does that just come under the no smoking rule? Um, I haven't thought, it, well, that's no smoking, but the, you can take it in other forms, I understand. Uh, Those I aren't legal yet. I haven't yet. had any, yeah. any uh, uh, worries about that. I think one of the good things that work is short term as well, because I've had language students who come for a month or a few weeks or a few months, but because they're not staying, to them it's a holiday. It's not a permanent residence. It's not their only home. And I'm not their mother. I don't have to teach them how to behave. Uh, and so there, there's a general good rapport, and I think that, that really helps. That was the next question. Can they uh, bring home boyfriends, girlfriends? Is that an issue? Well, uh, it has not been an issue. And uh, do they? Uh, however, I did have a, a student from France, and his wife came for a week. That was fine. <laughs> OK. Um, if, if they're taking in students, and if the students uh, want to, uh, in today's parlance, hook up, uh, is that something they have to work well, out in advance? Well, that is something that's part of the application process. So that is that is a question that we ask. We ask the homeowner, how do you feel about guests? How do you feel about overnight guests? We ask the students the same questions. Is, is this something that you would like? If there are some ground rules around, you know, not every night, and uh, it can't be a regular thing because now we're introducing a different dynamic and relationship to the household. But there is, there's been a lot of easygoingness around that. I know, Bob, you do the legal part of the co-agreements, but do you usually spell out the condition? I mean, there's 
there's changing in your life if you know your life status changed but have you seen uh, scenarios where it's just people can't live together that they're breaking up like a divorce? Well, <clears throat> when people want to set up something like this, they'll come to me, I've done this for years, and they, we have an agreement. I have a checklist of all the issues, and I sit down and I ask them, what about food, what about expenses, what about you have cable, you have internet, are we sharing it? Um, so we have a, a, a template for uh, a joint, I call it a joint venture agreement. There's three parts of it. Uh, in the ownership scenario, not in the uh, landlord and student. So the first part is how it's going to operate, how we're going to share expenses, who's going to get the living room, that sort of thing. How it's going to operate on an ongoing basis. I just okay. want to know uh, if you've seen a, a lot of situations where it, it's not a change in the person's uh, kind of status, but it's it's just a matter of not getting along that leads to the end of the agreement. And that's the end of the agreement is how do we unwind this? Yeah. And that's the big thing. It's really a divorce agreement yeah. that you enter into when everybody's getting along well. Yeah. You have to provide for unwinding it. Yeah. <clears throat> I definitely find that when I sit down with new groups of people, the very first question I ask them is, have you talked to a lawyer and have you thought about how you want to structure this agreement? The most important piece for me is being a remedy in case there is default, but also a remedy in case there's disagreement. And that's a big one. We talk about the what ifs. Yeah. And part of when we're having our conversation, we go through a series of what ifs with <laughs> CARP members or other people that we're helping. You know, what if somebody has a new partner? What if one of the partners dies? What's happening in the will? What if somebody needs to move for work? And we go through those kind of what yeah. ifs, and not to make it a conflicting question, but because we don't think necessarily that we are gonna fall and break a hip and need to go into hospital and then move into some type of assistive care, and that this house that we're buying has stairs in it. So we try to make sure that we support people going through that thinking process at a high level, but without trying to make it sound like a scary proposition, and to make sure we support people in coming up with contingency plans. I think the advanced practice is the part that really can help. Um, there, there's also this, uh aspect of it that it can be used as a means to be able to age in place, to be able to stay in, in your home longer. Uh, are people thinking of that? Very much so. That's a critical part of it is people want to stay in their community. They want to stay, if possible, on their street. They'd like a nicer quality of housing, close to services and so on. And you know, whether it's a generational issue or whether it's a peer-to-peer -peer issue, people know that, you know, that can be very expensive. And we can do some thinking. Maybe we're buying a new place with an idea that it's going to be a single floor. Or we're buying a place with the idea that there can be a caregiver in it. So a lot of that is either forward thinking and purchasing new property or looking at existing property and saying, what needs to happen here in terms of other people or other support? So it's a very, very helpful tool to age in place. Okay. When we come back, the benefits and the pitfalls. That's nice. There are some pitfalls. Yeah. Well, some yeah. of the things we worry about is unsuccessful son in the basement who then moves in with him and his band and everybody else and then older adult then becomes a bit of a hostage to that circumstance. Welcome back. Well, still, opening up your home to a stranger or being the person who chooses to rent space in someone else's home can still be daunting. There are also some obvious benefits, especially for older Zoomers. Laura, we started to talk about this. It's the social inclusion and being able to stay in your house longer. People are loving it. They're loving the Golden Girls style environment. They're saying, you know, these are the people that I might want to go on vacation with. These are my best friends. Maybe our spouses have died. Maybe it's a time of life question where we buy a house together or a piece of property together. And this is a way that we're going to really purposefully live together. We know that Zoomers, as they're aging, are taking in that quality of life piece very, very seriously. And whether it's a peer-to-peer -peer type of group of people coming together, like the kind of Golden Girls style, or whether it's across a bit of a generation, maybe with children or grandchildren as being part of it, 
Zoomers are finding fantastic social benefits and able to stay in communities that they like. Now, has anybody ever thought of, I always had this thought, and even, well, still a couple, get together uh, with friends in a bigger place and kind of hire people and get a driver and a housekeeper and uh, all of that. Um, one of my most successful projects was helping a group of people who were friends. There were three couples. They decided to downsize, so they're now living mortgage-free in a beautiful triplex. And they have, in fact, going to hire a caregiver to live on site. They're com committed to communal living, but on a limited basis. And they are going on vacations. They're having the time of their life. And partly it's because they've reduced their economic stress. But they've also integrated things in their life that have actually made things easier for them to age and age well. Um, and as we know... Like? Well, for example, a caregiver. Oh, OK. If, yeah. if a caregiver comes in, or someone to come and clean. So one cleaner for six people is much cheaper than one person paying someone to come in. So it's all about integration of those kinds of but expenses. But they charge more if there's more to clean. Well, yes, it's relative. <laughs> of course, they, they do. But I think the issue is, is that they're not reliant on one income. So they have many incomes to sort of generate their lifestyle. And it's really working for them. And, and um, back to uh, the arrangement where you have uh, seniors taking in people. Uh, in most of these arrangements, is, it, uh, is there a rent factor or is it a combo? It's, it's rent and you take out the garbage and help me with this and that? That's one of the reasons that CARP has been so happy to partner with the Home Share Project because it really does depend on the needs of those people. So there can be social offset in terms of what would ordinarily be paid for services. By other people, it's critically important that that income, and I, and I heard you were saying that originally, that income can make the difference of them staying in their house or not staying in their house. So that conversation and that facilitated conversation really makes sure that it fits the needs of those people. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Okay. And um, you were saying that you needed the income. Did that change over time? Uh, yes, it changed over time when I got my own pension. But also, um, at the time I was on the school board, it was, it was a very difficult time under Mike Harris. Uh, but also, the income was only a part of it. It, it helped fill a little gap. Mm -hmm. But it was also having the young people in the house uh, and cooking for them. I, I enjoy cooking, but who likes to cook for yourself? Whereas I, would, I enjoyed shopping, finding the bargains, um, putting things on the table. And that was, that was a part of it that was enjoyable too. And also the help. I, I never asked for help, but the students always wanted to walk the dog, which she never said no. <laughs> and um, you're carrying groceries in and oh, they, they carry them. Well, I can do it. But it is nice to have help when you're loaded with everything in the house. But what happens when it doesn't work out like that? So we, there are some pitfalls. Yeah, well, some yeah. of the things we worry <laughs> about is uh, an exploitation. So one of the ways that you could have looked at that relationship with a bit of a query in your eye is, is there a fair exchange, whether that be an emotional exchange or whether that be an exchange of services or a, a financial exchange? The contrast is what we call sort of the unsuccessful son in the basement who then moves in with him and his band and everybody else and ends up taking over. And what happens is the older adult then becomes a bit of a hostage to that circumstance. And we certainly know that when we're looking at elder abuse and neglect, oh, yes. it's a huge piece of it. In a way, the home share agreement and that facilitated supports can protect against the abuse. So the other question is when an older adult enters into this, are there situations when their children might object? We, I haven't experienced that in any of our matches. In fact, a lot of our older adults come to us saying, my daughter forwarded this to me or my son forwarded this to me. So a lot of family actually is quite supportive of the home share projects. They, of course, want to see that we're doing everything that we can to mitigate any risk that the older adult might face. So we run background checks and vulnerable sector screenings. Oh, good. I, I, uh, so the background check is included. That's absolutely. great. Absolutely. Yep. We run reference checks. And, uh, and the home share agreement 
lays out very clearly. In our situation in the, in the pilot project, there is a rent exchanged. We feel that it is an important part of the process that the student begins to take some ownership for the house that they are going to now live in. Uh, and, and by ownership, I mean that they are aware that this is somebody's home that they are entering into and it's going to cost them something. Mind you, it is way below the average cost of a single bedroom uh, in the city of Toronto. So uh, there is, there's lots of things in place to help uh, mitigate any of those pitfalls. Well, I, I'm assuming that on the one hand, it would probably lift a bit of the burden from a child who has to come and help out, but they might be wary that their parent might get too attached to the person, maybe they end up putting them in the will. I mean, stuff like that, I'm sure. Uh, it's but. real. Where we've seen the concern points be is when there's an ownership issue rather than a rental issue. And so by that, I mean, if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to co-house with somebody else, but it's the family home, they're saying, well, what's happening to that in the will for me going on? So they're interested in that. From the concern about predation or undue influence that tends to be a thing that's happening anyway in the world in a way having a home share pilot and having a contract can be a bit of a protective measure we are seeing many many family members who are far away from parents and they say if I just knew that my mom was safe, that she wasn't falling, if I just knew that there was food in the fridge, oh, could you be a contact person? Okay. When we come back, co-ownership. What you need to know before purchasing that home with another buyer or buyers. That's next. <laughs> By moving in together to share expenses and good times, these retirees have been able to age gracefully in this large 3,400 square foot home with all the extras, including an elevator. Say hello to Louise, Martha, Sandy, and Beverly, who's currently relaxing at her timeshare in Florida. Together they make up Port Perry, Ontario's very own version of the Golden Girls. Hi. Thank you for being a friend. Travel down the road and back again. Your heart is true. You're a pal and a confidant. By moving in together to share expenses and good times, these retirees have been able to age gracefully in this large 3,400 square foot home with all the extras, including an elevator. Yeah, sure, let's go for a ride. Rent porch, <laughs> deeper stairwell treads, and wider doorways. It was probably the most economical way of aging, being able to share on the cost of services, mm -hmm. quite a number of things. And, and, you know, companionship, because loneliness is one of the real key issues for, for aging people. So basis. you're saying it would cost $100,000 a year? Yes. To stay in retirement? Home? Yes, and you, you completely eliminate, in many cases, the equity that you had in your home and your savings. And so our retirement homes have told us that they have two very difficult times. One is when they say nobody has enough money to come in, and the other is your money's run out, you've lived too long. My favorite thing is the fact that uh, both my boys, my siblings, they're happy to. They know that I'm safe and that uh, if anything happens, somebody might come to my rescue. The girls have even created a website for others interested in learning about home sharing. You can check it out at 100perrystreet.ca. You know, Darren, we have room for one more roommate. Oh, yeah, really? But you've got to earn your keep. In Port Perry, Ontario, I'm Darren Maharaj for Zoomer News. Hey, Darren, you missed the spot. Okay, all right. Thank you for being a friend. Well, as you can see from Darren's report, the driving force behind home sharing is the soaring cost of housing. But there's a lot more to it than that. And when it comes to co-ownership with people who are not family, the legal details have to be airtight. Kelly, you just moved into a home with a couple of your friends. How did you set it up? Um, well, basically, we first started talking about it. I didn't think it would actually happen. <laughs> it just seemed like, really, you could do that? And uh, we realized everybody kind of wanted the same thing, wanted to live in the same type of house. We wanted gardens and can't really afford that, a big house in Toronto. So we moved on the outskirts 
of the city. And uh, so I called my lawyer and talked to him about it. And I was told more and more people are doing this. So I felt more secure. <laughs> so how did you set up the legalities of it? Uh, our uh, lawyer set up a co-agreement and we just went through it saying if something were to happen to each one of us, um, if we need to buy it, uh, have a buyout, certain percentage, um, we would get back what we put in. Okay, um, Bob, uh, this is your bread and butter. There are a lot of caveats. So there's an agreement. I'm assuming there's usually a first rights refusal, which means that your co-owners have the first right to buy you out. But okay. Um, who decides on the right price for that in the current market? And what if the co-owners don't agree on what the right price also, is? Also, what if they can't afford it? So if, if I say you can buy me out, but you know that that person can't afford it, yeah. it's kind of illusory to have an agreement that looks good on paper, but it'll never be enforced. <clears throat> I had a situation where I had three Filipino nannies some years ago, and they decided it would be cheaper to co-own a house. So they bought a house, they used another lawyer, and then two of the Philippine nannies decided that they would share their bedrooms with, uh, platonically, with a subtenant. So we now had five people living in the house. And the odd person out decided that she wanted to share the expenses five ways instead of three ways. And they all wound up in small claims court. They were suing each other. And, Oh dear. Yeah, so they, they eventually all came to me to sit down and see if we could resolve it. And I think we eventually worked out something. Okay, so one of Kelly's roommates decides she wants out. Uh, who decides what, what the right price for it? I mean, hopefully your home will appreciate. Uh, so who decides what the right price is uh, for that share? Well, one way of doing it is you get two appraisals and you take the average. The problem is you can't really put a sign on the front of the house that says for sale, half interest, third interest, because nobody's going to buy in. Yeah. And that's the problem. So how do you buy out a partner when there's really no market for that one third interest? And, and especially when you know your partner is in there because they couldn't afford a whole house and now they're being asked to buy you out. It's, it's very difficult. Well, that's part of your business is, is to yeah, match people. Exactly, and it is one of the risks. It, it makes co-ownership much more difficult than traditional ownership. But I think what we need to do is push these in, the sort of the institutional belief that there isn't an interest for a third of a house. I think, in fact, we do see in other parts of the world, you buy a flat in London, England, you're buying a flat in a house, but it's the main floor. I do think we have room to start looking at more creative ways. It's not there yet. So in our discussions with people who are looking at co-ownership, we talk about exit plans and we talk about safety nets. Three months in the bank if someone loses their job. So no one's panicked over dinner that night. It's like you've got three months to figure this problem out. So default is a big issue. Okay, yes. So Def okay, go default ahead. Is, yes. It's important to recognize that that's probably going to happen over the span, especially as younger families do this. Right? They get into the market by co-ownership. There's going to be life changes. So being able to address them. So the, how do you assess the price of the house? How do you do an exit plan? And how do you have first right of refusal are all very important issues. But I also think it means shifting the way we think about home, home ownership. Kelly, did you deal with what happens if somebody loses their well, job? Or? Um, yeah, we have talked about that. And uh, the house I moved in has five bedrooms. So if worse comes to worse, I could rent out one of the bedrooms to an extra tenant or the basement can be turned. It has a kitchen down there with a separate entrance. So if need be, I have an extra space. Okay. What about uh, if one person dies uh, and leaves their share, presumably to their heir? What happens then? Then you're going to have a default. And it's the whole, it's the whole issue of buying the estate out. Does, can the estate buy the others out? What if the people don't want to move? Eventually, you may just have to say, if somebody's in default more than 90 days, the place goes on the market. Problem is, what if somebody doesn't want to sign? They're living there rent-free. One person's <laughs> in default. Yeah. Maybe the estate's in default and stops paying. Right. Okay, so you've got two people paying and one person not paying. One person says, hey, that's great. I don't have to pay anymore. How do you yeah. get rid of them? If they say, I don't want to sell, I don't want to pay, or I can't pay. How do you resolve that? 
I said to Kelly, I mean, like, you're, you're a young woman. You or one of your friends, you, you might uh, decide to get married at some point. And you're part, or, you know. It, well, we've set it up as well that if one were to leave, we can cover the house, carry the house with just two people as well. So that was another thing that we worked out, so. Oh, that's really smart. Yes, yes, because we were worried that what so if somebody have, loses but a job? Can you afford to buy them out and carry the house? Um, on my own, I don't know about that. But <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. One of the things we do in our agreements is we actually ask for people to sign a mediation agreement so that the first step in trying to resolve any difficulty is to sit down and try and have it mediated or alternative dispute resolution where you try and avoid litigation. I mean, again, you go into this most likely with the mindset that you want it to work out. I know that there are horror stories, but we do ask people at the very beginning of this process, are you a person who's committed to compromise? Do you understand what it means to live in a shared environment? And I, I stress the kitchen and the bathroom are the two rooms that cause the most tension, right? So if you can do anything to have your own kitchen and your own bathroom, that's probably going to save a lot of headache and then in the, the TV. beginning. The TV is okay. the third oh, well, now okay. everyone has that on their phone their anyway. TV, so, like... yeah, yeah. So we do stress that. When we're looking at it on a forward basis, uh, CARP is, is looking at how universal design, how, how when we're building, yes. we can think about making those buildings flexible so people can age in place. So let's think about not just having wider doorways, although that's important. Let's think about walls that can come in and out. Let's think about rooms that can be segmented more easily. Let's think about bathrooms and kitchens on every floor. When we're thinking about making sure that the asset remains viable, having that flexibility to either rent or sever, I think can really help a lot. Okay, we've got to take a break, but there is more coming up afterwards. Stay tuned. She was trying to find compatible housemates first and then yes. find yes. Uh, the property. Yes. We suggested find the property first, build it, and they'll come. Right. Welcome back. Now it's time for questions from the audience. Hi, Janet. my name is Janet Miller and I live in Whitby. And what I'm finding is that um, the rental costs for an apartment, I live in an apartment right now, are getting astronomical as well. So what I'm looking for is the best way to find other people who are interested in possibly renting a house together. I don't necessarily have the money to, to, to buy, but renting looking for two other or two or three other compatible people that could rent a house because you can certainly rent a house, reduce your costs and not pay as much in rent because rent like anywhere else is getting expensive. If this, um, I mean, it's a, it's a small twist on the arrangements exactly. that, that we've been talking about. And uh, have you seen a demand for that? I have, and I've actually had a couple of clients I've helped with that. Mm -hmm. The best advice I can give um, where we tried it the other way, where she was trying to find compatible housemates first and yes. then find yes. uh, the property. Yes. Um, she ended up finding the property. We suggested find the property first, build it, and they'll come. Right. And it was much easier because trying to, first of all, find those housemates, but as well trying to figure out where you want to live. Exactly. Agreeing on the lease. Her name is only on the lease. Right. And she's made sure she has enough savings to cover it. Right. But then she has two housemates that came in. Okay. And it's just that compatibility piece is huge. Yes, so it is. So spend a lot of time discussing what yes, your lifestyle stop, is stop like. Stop things. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. When we come back, we'll hear some final thoughts from our panelists. On Facebook, Ashley writes, I've been home sharing for the past three years, and so far, so good. I have some extra cash in my pocket and some company for when I feel lonely. On Twitter, Sean tweets, Home sharing is the only option for someone like me who can't afford to carry a mortgage on their own. And thanks to home sharing, I've made a friend for life. Hashtag home sharing. On Facebook, Crystal says, 
With the vacancy rate being so low in the GTA, it only makes sense for more communities to consider home sharing programs. We need to do more to address the housing crisis in our city. Keep the comments coming in. And don't forget, for free tickets to the show, go to www.universe.com and search Zoomer Media. Welcome back. Our panelists will leave you with some final thoughts, starting to my left. We're excited at CARP about the ideas of co-ownership and different types of home supports. We look forward to making sure that as part of this pilot project that those kind of social work supports are there to help the matching process as we move forward. Oh, well, my experience has been good, but I, as I mentioned, I don't think it's the whole solution to the housing problem, but for some people it may be a, a great help and enjoyable. Uh, and as we age, and as we're all aging, uh, different solutions have to be found. Okay. I think cooperative real estate and co-ownership is going to be the next wave in uh, real estate, and I'm looking forward to being a thought leader in that. Okay. I agree with Leslie. I really think this is what I did was the right thing, and I hope it. I'm going to be there for many, many years with my housemates. <laughs> And yeah, as well at Home Share Alliance, part of our mission is just shining a light on the benefits of shared living and just creating that cultural shift. So it's a perfect opportunity today to see all these different ideas at the table. Build a dream team, a dream team of experts, real estate agent, uh, tax accountant, lawyer, and your insurance person. We didn't mention insurance today, but make sure your insurance person knows if you're oh, renting out, point. it becomes a business hey, you may not be insured if, if there's a business there. Tell your insurance agent and get a lawyer who can craft the agreement for you. I think home share pr programs and co-housing can be a great way to address social isolation among seniors. And I would really like to see um, this movement grow <clears throat> from our small pilot project in the city of Toronto to something that is uh, national and accepted. And as Tara said, a cultural shift and a language shift on what housing and affordable housing looks like. Okay, well, with the rising cost of real estate, the aging population, and the drive to age in place, home sharing is bound to get much better. And as always, Zoomers are on the cutting edge. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you soon. It's time to Zoom out.